morning. Welcome on this uh, Sunday. We're so glad to have you come. If you're visiting us for the first time to worship with us, we're privileged. Uh, if it's been a while um, or this is your first visit, there are visitor welcome cards on the back of the pew right in front of you. If you could fill that out and put it in the offering basket later, uh, then we'd know you came and we can pray for you and, um, and I can write you a card and, and acknowledge your visit. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Young Women's Fellowship uh, on May 3rd, Friday. Um, Kathy Zorn's uh, Neighborhood Taco Party. You can see that. And then Vacation Bible School is uh, upon us soon. Um, you know that the summer is almost here when, when uh, Mary Fromm uh, starts advertising for, for vac Vacation Bible School. So we're really excited about our uh, community outreach uh, to the young people, to, to our children. Well, um, why don't we hear from our missions report from, from Mr. Benfield. At the beginning of Romans 9, Paul tells us that he would cut himself off from Christ in order that his brothers, the people of Israel, would accept the gospel. Paul was the apostle to the uncircumcised, the apostle to the Gentiles, yet he had a special heart for his own people, a desire to see them follow Christ. When we look at Sardar and Anila Din, we see a similar devotion in heart to bring the gospel to their own people. Sardar, having been raised in Pakistan, lived for years as an adult here in Long Beach as a member of this church, but the burden that he felt for the people of Pakistan brought him to the mission field in Lahore. This morning, I'll share with you some highlights from Sardar's life and ministry, describe their current mission work in Pakistan, and share with you their most pressing prayer requests, which you'll also find on page nine in today's bulletin. Sardar became a Christian as a small, illiterate village boy through the witness of American missionaries that provided his education and challenged him to dedicate his life to Christian service. After completing his education in Pakistan and India, Sardar worked for the American Embassy in the Fulbright Foundation in Pakistan. Eventually, as a young man, Sardar moved to the United States and spent many years in this church with his first wife, Nassim, and their three children. In the early 90s, Sardar and Nassim felt a great burden to share the gospel with their brothers and sisters in Pakistan and settled in Lahore, a city of over 10 million people in Punjab province of Pakistan. 97% of the people that live in Lahore are Muslim. Sardar and Nassim labeled together for several years until Nassim passed away in 1997. Later, Sardar married Anila, who has helped continue the missionary work there. During their time in Pakistan, Sardar and Nassim, and now Anila, have initiated a very wide range of different ministries addressing a lot of different needs. Sardar began his mission work in Lahore, teaching at the Presbyterian Theological Seminary of Pakistan to train pastors and church planters for the region, and this remains a core part of the work there to this day. For 25 years, they've run Christian day schools called Calvin Academies for local children. They have four campuses now with, over, with uh, approximately 2,100 students and another campus currently being planned. There are several dozen churches in the region that they work to support through the Bible-believing Lahore Church Council. They operate 30 literacy centers out of these churches using the Bible as the text to teach basic reading skills. 75% of the people in Pakistan are illiterate, so this has been a very fruitful ministry effort. They operate a medical clinic with a doctor and nurse that treats 40 to 50 patients a day, and they offer care to both Christians and Muslims. They run a small school to teach women sewing skills to help get them jobs. Every day, Sardar reads the Bible on a loudspeaker for the people in his community. To support the churches in the area, there is a traveling discipling ministry that covers hundreds of miles to go from church to church to conduct Bible studies with over 100 people attending. Sardar translates classic Christian books into Urdu. And then in addition to these regular operations, they also conduct Bible studies, do administrative work, have periodic convention gatherings, and conduct training for church elders in the region. So how can you be praying for Sardar and Anila? Now first, there are a number of praises to share. In 2018, they had a significant series of banking issues that they faced 
that seemed to be a result of diplomatic tensions between the United States and Pakistan. They found themselves unable for the entire year to transfer money from their supporters and the mission organizations in the United States to their bank accounts in Pakistan. And this problem endured through almost the entirety of 2018 and severely impacted their ability to run the mission's work. But we can praise God that this issue was resolved successfully at the beginning of 2019, and now the funds are flowing uh, internationally after a very lean previous year. We can also praise God for growth that they've seen recently. Their Calvin Academy schools are playing a role in drawing people from their communities into their churches, and in recent months, three pastors have been ordained after graduating from the seminary. Additionally, there are things to petition the Lord for. First, pray that the Calvin Academy schools would not have to register with the government. There's growing pressure for them to register, and apparently registering with the government would mean that they would have to stop being distinctly Christian schools, and they would have to suspend uh, their Christian doctrine, their Christian practices that they teach to the children. So this is definitely something to be, be praying for. Pray also for the teachers and the students at the school, at the schools that the teachers would have wisdom and that the students would grow spiritually and academically. Pray also for upcoming construction projects that they have planned for the schools. For Cal Calvin Academy 2 and Wendala Dial Shah, the school is currently crammed inside the local church. They hope to have two classrooms built by the end of this year with a total of 10 classrooms in the long run. For Calvin Academy 4 in Faisalabad, their newest school, they hope to begin building facilities soon. Pray that for these construction projects, the funds would become available and that they would be able to proceed with the construction without any holdups once they get started. Although the banking issues have been resolved uh, over the last few months, they still have significant financial shortfalls. So pray that the support would be steady and that they would be able to catch up to all of their financial obligations from the previous year. Pray for Sardar, who is now 86 and has health issues that will require surgery. Pray also for Reverend Dennis Rowe, who leads the Westminster Biblical Missions and is currently back from Pakistan in the United States to un undergo treatment for liver disease. Finally, Sadar and Anila have plans to visit the United States later this year, but could be held up for a variety of reasons. Pray that they would be able to come and spend time stateside later this year. Sardar and Anila have a heart for the people of Pakistan. They came to know Christ through the work of missionaries, and for the last two and a half decades, they've built a flourishing mission work that at the core preaches the gospel of faith in Christ. Pray that this mission work would endure and grow, and that Christ's kingship would be made known, and that God would be glorified in Pakistan. Thank you. Friends, brothers, and sisters, would you rise with me for the call to worship? This is where the Lord calls us into his presence by faith. The call to worship comes this morning from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we come to you this morning thankful that we have been justified by faith that we are in a right relationship with you, that our sins are forgiven once and for all, that we have a righteousness that is not our own, a righteousness that has been given to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not only that, you have accepted us and adopted us into your family, and now we gather as your children to sit at your feet, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to worship you and adore you because you alone are worthy of our praise, because you alone are God of heaven and earth. Lord, would you give us your Holy Spirit to enliven us, to illuminate us, to revive us, uh, and to, uh, to point us to heaven. Lord, would you bless um, all that we do uh, through faith. We ask all of these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now, if you would open your, your uh, bulletins to page two as we sing our opening songs of praise, I stand in awe.
You may be seated. Now, if you would turn with me in uh, the Red Trinity hymnals to our responsive reading of Psalm 133 on page 834. This is a, uh, a psalm of, of praise for uh, unity and fellowship within the church. I'll read the irregular print, and you'll respond with the bold, and we'll say the last line together. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Now the choir will bring us the anthem.
Junior Church is now dismissed. Now let's unite our hearts together as we pray as one people. Uh, one of the many wonderful uh, gospel privileges that we have as we pray together. Our Father, we come to you this morning as your redeemed people, as your, your needy, weak, and beloved children. Father, we thank you that you have redeemed us from sin and from death and darkness, and you have transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of of your beloved and marvelous Son. Father, we thank you that we who walked in darkness now walk in the light, in newness of life, born again, uh, growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, applying all the grace that you've given to us in Christ and realizing them in our everyday relationships, in our everyday workplaces, our schools, our communities, Help us, Lord, to be light in the darkness. Help us to be salt. Uh, and, and help us then to be good witnesses, testifying with our lives and with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord and you love sinners and you came and you, you even sent your one and only Son to seek and save that which was lost. Father, we... We confess that we have fallen short of your glory in so many ways. We have not loved you with all of our heart, strength, soul, and mind. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have been selfish. We have uh, thought only of ourselves, or we've thought of ourselves first, and, and even you and everything else is second. Lord, that has caused us to say things we shouldn't have said, to do things we shouldn't have done, uh, that we have been proud and boastful, We've lusted, we have, um, we have sinned against you in so many different ways. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us because Jesus laid down his life uh, for us so that we might be able to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in him and you would add everything else unto us. Lord, teach us the futility of self-centeredness and remind us of the great blessing of, of self-sacrifice in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to, to be washed by the blood of Jesus that pours from Emmanuel's veins, that the water and the blood would flow and cleanse us, and that we would be made whiter than snow, that you would, um, you would throw our sins into the depths of the sea, that you would separate us from our sins as, as far as the east is from the west, as high as the heavens are from the earth, so also will you remember our sins no more. We're so thankful for that wonderful gospel privilege and blessing. Father, we come to you, Lord, on behalf of your people. We pray for those who are sick and ill among us, that you would help them and heal them and comfort them. We pray, Lord, for ourselves. Lord, we struggle with those sins that we've confessed. Lord, through your forgiving grace, would you heal us? Would you help us to turn from the idols that drive us to sin? And that we would behold you, the greatest good in all the universe, the greatest blessing that we could ever um, have, and that we would find our, our deepest satisfaction and identity and peace and joy in following you, in, to, in having you as our God and we as your people, so that we would not want to fill the void in our hearts with anything else, because you alone uh, fill that void, that that we are restless in this world until and unless we find our rest in Thee. Father, we pray for our country on the federal, state, and local level that You would give wisdom to our leaders. Lord, would You um, give them uh, just, uh, a sense of justice and equity and patience and, and compassion so that, that the things that they do in making judgments and, and legislating laws and, and upholding the laws of the land, that, that it would bring peace and unity and prosperity, Father, and it would help us then also to lead quiet and peaceful lives. Father, we pray for the persecuted church throughout the world. We pray, Lord, 
uh, for those in Pakistan who are un living under intense persecution, we pray for Sri Lanka in the aftermath of the attacks. Father, we pray that, uh, that the, uh, the Christian ethic of grace, that we would not repay anyone evil for evil, but we would turn the other cheek and that we would um, extend grace and forgiveness. Help us then to be uh, examples of that throughout the world. Lord, we also pray for, um, we pray for, for the, the Jewish synagogue that was under attack this past uh, Passover. We pray, Father, for the freedom to worship, uh, Lord, uh, in this country, which, under which we ourselves have that freedom. Help us, Lord, not only to fight for our own right to worship, but help us to fight for, for other people as well, uh, Lord, uh, because uh, our gospel, our kingdom, is uh, not by coercion, uh, but by persuasion, but, and also by love and grace and mercy and kindness. And so, Lord, help us then to, to pray for, for those who would do, uh, do us harm and those who would do anyone else harm. Father, would you also bless our church as we prepare to give of our tithes and of our offerings? Lord, help us to give them cheerfully. Help us to be generous because you have been generous with us, that you who did not withhold your one and only son, how will you not give us everything. Father, we give you just a token of, uh, of what, what belongs to you already. We ask that you would use it for the, the growth uh, and, and the glory of your kingdom. Lord, would you bless us this morning? In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. The ushers may now take the morning offering. Please rise with me and open your hymnals to number 348, a hymn of thanksgiving. We'll sing the first five verses, Jesus with thy church abide, 348.
be seated. Now, if you would open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're, con- we're uh, resuming and taking up uh, our, our uh, morning series through 1 Thessalonians, Our Glorious Hope. We're nearing the end. Just a few more um, sections. If you have a different Bible or you don't have a Bible... Um, with you, you can also follow along on page 5 of the worship bulletin. Just to give you a little bit of of context, the Apostle Paul, in the first section of chapter 5, has described the suddenness, the surprise, the unexpectedness of Jesus' return and, and many of the blessings that come along with it, including the resurrection from the dead. And, and so then he, at the end of, of this section, he talks, he, he encourages, he commands and exhorts the Thessalonian church. Therefore, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Not only in, in the truth of Jesus' uh, future return and all the blessings that come with it, but also in the practicalities of, of their Christian life as they anticipate, as they wait in hope for Jesus' return. That if we believe all of these things about the gospel of Jesus' return, then it ought to make an impact in our lives. And that's why he ends the letter exactly the way he does. That these are the ways in which we uh, build one another up and encourage one another in the way that we live, in the way that we relate to one another. So with that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this concluding section of practical instruction and teaching by the Apostle Paul. Lord, may it not only apply to the Thessalonians uh, in that day, but also to us, to Faith Presbyterian Church here today in Long Beach. Lord, I pray that your word and, and the instructions that are contained within it, would go forth and it would not return unto you void without giving us the clear and helpful ways in which we can live out our Christian lives in light of the great and glorious gospel. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear now the reading of God's holy word, beginning in verse 12. We ask you, brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. May he add his blessing to it this morning. You know, if you don't know what unhealthiness looks like, then you will be unable to understand what healthiness ought to look like. Unless you understand a well-functioning body or a well-functioning engine or, or appliance and and it breaks, you'll never understand how it breaks. You'll never be able to fix it. And I think we take this, this idea for granted. I think we have, you know, sometimes, you know, personally in our relation, or in our relationships or in our workplaces, uh, in our marriages, maybe with, in our relationship with our children and friends, I think we fall into bad habits. We have forgotten what a, what a, a healthy relationship ought to be and what it ought to look like. 
Um, maybe even with respect to our own bodies. We have forgotten what a healthy lifestyle uh, ought to look like. So we eat lots of junk food, lots of salt. Um, you, know, you know, as we gain some weight, a little a pound here and there over, over years and years uh, can really uh, do a lot of damage. And it's all because uh, it snuck up on us because we've forgotten what health is, what, what a healthy lifestyle ought to be. Uh, and so we, sometimes we may think that we are healthy, but in actuality we're not. Um, I was watching, I was watching uh, this uh, show on, uh, about you know, gastric bypass surgery, and, uh, and this lady was, um, was not healthy. At least you could see that she was not healthy, but her, even her doctor said everything is, is fine. And, um, and it was just... It just, I was flabbergasted. Um, and maybe, and I think maybe for the doctor too, you know, he's forgotten what, what it means to be healthy. And the same goes for, for the New Testament church. That, that we as a church, in our relationship to one another, and your relationship to me, we can fall into all kinds of bad habits. We can forget what it means to extend grace. We can forget what it means to forgive one another, just as we've been forgiven. We can forget what it means to love someone uh, in spite of their sins, to love them unconditionally the way that God loves us in the gospel, uh, to, uh, and to turn the other cheek when we feel like we've been uh, wronged for whatever reason. You know, maybe someone said something uh, that we, we perceived as, as hurtful, and maybe they didn't mean it that way, but that's how we received it. And then all of a sudden, we have a grudge. We, we, we uh, talk badly about them, or, act, or maybe we think badly about them in our hearts. Maybe we try to, to stay away from them. We feel a sense of tension. And, and so we fall into all kinds of bad habits in the life of our church. And we become an unhealthy church. The Apostle Paul this morning reminds us of the character and the attributes of what a healthy, gospel-centered, Christ-centered church ought to look like. These are the things that, that healthy, Christ-centered churches do. And so it gives us a sense of, of how healthy or unhealthy our church may be. Uh, Mark Deaver uh, describes this idea this way. He says, a healthy church is not a church that's perfect and without sin. It has not figured everything out. Rather, it's a church that continually strives to take God's side in the battle against the ungodly desires and deceits of the world, our flesh, and the devil. It's a church that continually seeks to conform itself to God's Word. And that's what our, our passage is about this morning. That we are going to conscientiously, intentionally, deliberately seek to conform our life to this particular passage of Scripture. And as we near the end of Paul's letter here, he gives us a, a final list of instructions that, that they should follow because they are a New Testament church of Jesus Christ. He's telling these are prescriptions of a doctor to, to a patient, saying these are the things that you ought to do. Exercise, eat well, get good night's sleep. Um, don't eat every, every meal out at McDonald's. Um, these are the things that, that healthy churches ought to be doing. And, uh, and so we ought to think about areas in which we are healthy and areas in which we are not healthy. And so he gives us the attributes then of a healthy gospel-centered church in Christ and apply it to us. And so I split this section, this final section, into two parts. We're going to look at the first half this week and then the next half uh, the following week. And so let's look at the first of these attributes uh, in verses 12 to 15. So what is the first attribute? The first attribute of a healthy church is a Christ-centered respect and esteem for church leadership. In the first half of chapter 5, Paul reminded us of how we ought to live in the hope of Jesus' return. And, and look at what he says there in verses uh, 11, 10 and 11. We have, we've been destined not for wrath, but for salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 9. And that we should encourage and build one another up in these things. 
And, uh, and that's what Paul is doing here. He is applying the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ to our relationships and encouraging him and building us up in that process. And so he wants us to, he wants us to, help, he wants to help us apply these gospel truths to the life of our church. And he's speaking to us then as a church. As a church of Jesus Christ, who, and here, implied here is that that, that they need to a healthy respect for their church leaders. He gives us several reasons why. Why we need to respect and esteem church leaders. And, and I hope you won't take this in a self-serving manner, but, but this is what God's Word says. And, uh, and so I speak not, you know, as James Lim, but as a minister of the gospel, knowing that, um, that this is not, not only applies to our church, but every New Testament church. So we need to respect and esteem ministers and leaders, leaders of the church, because of their labor among us in the Word. Look at verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect, right, or honor, right, to, uh, to give them their due honor for what they do, those who labor among you. And then later on in verse uh, 13, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. See, the fact that Paul mentions it, again, means that they're not, maybe in some ways, they're not respecting their, their leaders as they ought to. Maybe they're, they're, uh, they're disrespecting them, or maybe they're just taking them for granted. Um, and, uh, and so it makes us think about, but why did God give us church leaders, those who are to, to lead us in the ministry of the word and of prayer and of the administration of the sacraments, to lead us in a biblical, God-centered, Christ-centered way in the church of Jesus Christ. And it's because when Jesus died and rose and ascended to heaven in Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul says that, that when he ascended into heaven, he gave gifts to his church. And what were those gifts? They were people. They were apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And, uh, and so, so apostles and prophets being the ext- what we ca- call the extraordinary offices. They, they are offices that were, were given for a special time in which the church is being formed, the Bible is being written. But once, once the, everything was established and the Bible was fully written and the canon was closed, there was no, no more need for apostles and, and prophets. Right? God has finally spoken in His Son, the uh, Hebrews says. And, and when the last apostle died, right, the, the, what was the requirement of an apostle? That they had to have face-to-face seen the risen Lord. And so, you know, if Jesus is up in heaven and then the apostles die, there's, by, by definition, there can be no more office of apostles. Those are the extraordinary offices, you know, for the early church. But then there's the ongoing ordinary offices of the evangelist, you know, the person who goes and, and preaches the gospel to all the world, to those who, who haven't heard the gospel, uh, to call sinners to repentance and faith. And then out of that evangelism, comes the formation of a New Testament church, and then you have pastors, right, shepherds, who minister the Word of God, who preach and teach and labor, feeding, right, feeding the sheep the Word of God, because we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I I, I love to cook. (laughs) Some of you know that. I love to cook, And, um, and, and pastors in many ways are are serving you the food of God's grace. Right? Not just bread and wine and, uh, you know, every couple of months in the Lord's Supper, but, but the bread, the life-giving bread, the manna come down from heaven in God's Word week in and week out. Right? And, um, and so, so these, these ordinary officers, leaders, pa- evangelists, pastors, uh, teachers, They all, their their core duty is to to distribute and to give and to serve the Word of God to the people of God, to the sheep of God. That's why when when Jesus asked Peter, do you you love me? 
And, and Peter said, of course I do, Lord. What did Jesus respond? He says, feed my sheep. And that's the kind of labor that, that the Apostle Paul is, is talking about here. And, um, and this is not an easy job. You know, some people, I mean, I, maybe some of you uh, feel this way, but, you know, some people think that pastors only work one day a week. You know, I mean, and, uh, and they think, oh, well, what else are you doing all, all the other days? I mean, how hard can it be to, to teach the Bible study? How hard can it be to preach two sermons? Um, it's hard. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual work of labor. Um, and not only is it hard um, spiritually and emotionally, because right? I have to, to, to apply these truths to my own heart in order to be able to, to properly convey it to your hearts. But, um, but it, there, it, it takes a mental toll, a physical toll, to, to sit down and really study and focus in on the Word of God. Um, and then also, you know, bearing the burdens of, of, of all of you and your hurts, in your struggles with sin, uh, to be able to um, help you, you know, spiritually, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, sometimes, you know, I hear the difficulties that you're going through, and, uh, and for pastors, when you hear those words, you know, to bear one another's burdens, it applies specifically to pastors in a way that doesn't apply to the rest of us. And I go to, I go to bed each night um, bearing your burdens with you. And, um, and, and I've never had so much white hair in my life these past uh, 12 years. Um, I remember a, uh, a mentor, you know, you might remember him, Larry Minninger. He was my mentor, and he preached my, uh, my uh, installation service here. And um, what you guys don't know is that he's, he's completely white. His hair is completely white. Uh, and he has two older brothers with not one gray hair on them. So, uh, so all of that is to say uh, it's labor. It's labor. It's work. It's, it's not a vacation. And, um, and Paul says over and over again uh, in his letters that servants of the Lord who labor in this manner literally pour themselves out just like Jesus did. That as under-shepherds, uh, as disciples of Christ in this particular way, we are not above our master, our great shepherd. And so in the way that he poured out his life, uh, ministers and, and evangelists and teachers pour out their lives as well. And uh, it's a kind of ongoing death that gives life to all of you. 2 Corinthians 4, 8-12. to We also need to respect and esteem ministers and elders uh, for their leadership in the Lord. Look at what Paul sa uh, the Apostle Paul says. He says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who are over you in the Lord. Right? They, they have authority over you in the Lord and ad admonish you. One of the reasons why, the, the, why God gives people authority over us in a spiritual, Christ-centered, gospel way in the Church of Jesus Christ is to help you and to say those things to you that you need to hear and you may not want to hear at that particular moment. But God gives us an authority, not in ourselves, but in as much as we convey to you the, the, the truths that you need to hear in order to, to make those corrections in your life, in order to, to hear those words that, you know what, that lifestyle, that, 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 that culture in which you're, you're living in, the things that you're doing uh, go against your faith. Okay, go against the grace of God that has been given to you. That God did not redeem you from sin in order to continue in your sin. He redeemed you from sin to live for Him, to turn from them. And that's, that's admonishment. And that's godly authority. And we do so not, with, not coercively. Right? We don't command you every time like a slave driver but we try to woo you, we try to persuade you, we try to give you the sweet grace of God so that sin would be bitter and God's love would be sweet, 
sweeter to your lips than honey, and you would want the grace, you would want the love more than you want the sin. And, um, and in as much, and here, here's the thing, this is what the idea of, of, of authority in the Lord, admonishment in the Lord means. It means that as representatives, right, as ambassadors of God through His Word, when I, when I admonish you according to God's Word, right, what I'm telling you about your life is what the Scriptures say to you, you need to deal with the Lord, not with me. And so when you disobey or when you obey, you do so in the Lord. You're obeying, disobeying in the Lord. And so when you do obey, you're doing it as unto the Lord, as I represent the Lord. And, um, and so as we labor in God's Word to lead you with God's Word, not in our own opinions, not in our own authority, then, then what the Apostle Paul is saying is you need to respect and to esteem it as unto the Lord. Right? That, that, um, it's very much like the prophets. When they spoke, they said, thus saith the Lord. And so when Israel rejected the prophets, they were really rejecting God, right? That's what, what, Paul, uh, the, that's what uh, God said to Samuel, right? You remember that? They are not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. And, um, and so this echoes the Apostle Paul's earlier words uh, in, verse, uh, in chapter 213. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you, believers. And so... So when I speak to you uh, about areas that make you feel uncomfortable, that maybe you're engaging in a particular lifestyle and, and sin, or maybe your, your, your faith is lukewarm and, and I'm trying to, to uh, light a fire under you to, to love the Lord and to live your life zealously for Him, um, you need to deal with the Lord. Even though I say it, you need to deal with the Lord. And so that's, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. And many times, friends, brothers and sisters, the way that we relate to those in godly authority over us speaks volumes about how, what, how we really feel about the Lord. Right? I think they are, they are barometers, they are indicators of our, our true relationship with the Lord. That when you hear God's word being applied to you through, through your shepherds, through ministers like me and elders, who want only the best for you, when you reject it, I can say this, you're not rejecting me, you're rejecting the Lord. And maybe, maybe the difficulty is that, that you don't want to be under God's authority, the way that you think you, you ought to be. Um, maybe you don't want to. You, you, don't want, you think that, that Jesus' yoke is too heavy for you. And, um, and so, so what I want to encourage you to consider is, is the, the openness and the humility with which you're willing to hear godly admonishment, godly advice, you know, godly encouragement is an indicator of where you stand with the Lord. That if you bristle at some of the things that I, I say to you right now, uh, maybe that's an indicator. Like, you know, maybe I need to, to submit myself deeper unto the Lord. Um, Jesus, this is what Jesus meant when he told his disciples, the one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me, Luke 10, 16. And so when we have a Christ-centered respect and relationship with our leadership, then it will lead to a, a Christ-centered relationship with each other. And this leads us to the second attribute. The second attribute of a healthy church is a Christ-centered relationship to each other in the church of Jesus Christ. And Paul moves from leadership to our life together in the church, and he shows us how to apply the grace of the gospel in all of our individual relationships in, in the church. 
that when we have peace in the gospel, we need to apply that peace to one another, to, the, to our life together. Look at the rest of verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves. The vertical blessings of the gospel should then overflow into the horizontal relationships uh, in the church. And so if we who were enemies of God have been reconciled by faith in Christ, so we've been forgiven and accepted and we have been justified, then we have peace with God. All right, Romans 5, 1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And so when we apply that peace with God, the nature of that peace, the, the, the nitty-gritty of that peace with God, and we apply it to our relationships to one another, because we have peace with God, we ought to have peace with one another. And what does that look like? That's what Paul gives us here. They, we ought to apply the same grace that we have received and give it to each other. We ought to be quick to forgive, slow to anger, because love covers a multitude of sins. We should keep short accounts, not only with God, with one another. Don't hold grudges. All the ways that God's grace in Christ brings peace with you and in you, we ought to turn it around and give it to one another and to do the same for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Robert Jones summarizes this idea this way. He says, our God is the God of peace. He has made saving peace with us through Christ Jesus. He pours out his inner peace on us and into us. He promises future global peace, and he calls and enables us to pursue relational peace with others. There's not a person on the planet, including your spouse, child, parents, or business partner, with whom you cannot pursue peace. Herein, then, we find our own identity as we walk in the ways of God our Father. Blessed are the peacemakers, said Jesus, for they will be called the sons of God. As we pursue peace in all our relationships and help others do the same, we reflect the character of our peacemaking God. See, what happens is that when churches fight among each other, when they split, when there's deep divisions, and not just in our church, right? In every relationship uh, that Christians participate in, in our marriages, in our families, in our workplaces, when there's division and strife, we have the peace of God with which the resources of that peace in which to apply in that situation. And that's what the rest of this section is all about. That, uh, that we ought to apply the peace that we have with our relationships. And, um, and then when we don't do that, when there is war and enmity and hostility, when we fight and argue and backbite, in any, re in any Christian relationship, what we're doing is we are, we are ignoring or forgetting the fact that we have peace with God. We are forgetting that we have been forgiven, and therefore we ought to forgive others. That God has been patient with us, and we ought to be patient with others. That, uh, that, that there are, are major things that we ought to fight over in a, in a godly way, but there are minor things that, you know, the color of, of the carpet, um, the, the particular songs that we sing, the way in which you do things, we sit, we stand, we raise our hands, we clap, whatever it is that ought not to divide us, because they're so minor. What we fight over... Uh, indicates what we think is most important and certain things uh, we ought, you know, um, we ought not to fight over because it's not a hill worth dying on, right? The way in which we do certain things is, is it's, it's not the gospel. Jesus saved us. Therefore, we have to fight over Jesus, right? And so we need to remember the gospel of peace. We also need to be patient with each other just as God has been patient with us in the gospel. And here Paul uses stronger language of urging, right? Of urging here in verse 14 rather than asking in verse 12. And we urge you, brothers, admonish and warn, right? Admonish or warn the idle, right? And what are, who are the idle people who dilly-daddly and loaf and, and they don't want to work because maybe they, they don't feel like working and they, they want to do what they want to do, but they don't want to work. See, idleness is a sin of, of self-centered 
laziness that leads to laziness. Not only laziness of life, but laziness of heart. And the reason why I say both life and heart is that, you know, you can actually have a nine-to-five job. You can actually work, you know, 40 hours a week, but you can still be idle in your heart. That you do the very bare minimum to get paid and to pay the bills, but you won't do any, you won't do, you won't lift a finger to do any more because you're working for yourself and you're not working for the glory of God. You're not working for the benefit of other people. You're not working to glorify God to, to be the best at what you do so that he might have the glory. You're doing just the bare minimum because, because you're lazy. Uh, or the idleness of life. That you have a cost-benefit analysis of everything that you do, and you just don't think that that's worth your time. Uh, you, know, you know, just that minimum wage job, I just, you know, that's just not enough. And so I'd rather just stay home and, and play my Xbox. I mean, you know, it, it, there's an idleness of self-centeredness. And, um, and what we're doing really is we're turning our backs on the, the redemption that Jesus redeems us from. And how did he redeem us? By working to the very end. It is finished when he died on the cross. He redeemed us so that then we who are idle might finish the work that God has given to us and to do it for his glory. We also need to encourage the faint-hearted. Now, the, the idea here of the faint-hearted is, is, is one that is timid or shy, someone who is constantly afraid of that something bad might happen or that God won't come through, waiting for the next shoe to drop. Does God love me? Why does God allow every bad thing to happen to me? Right? If they're doubting Thomases, uh, the faint-hearted are doubting are, are, are Debbie Downers. <laughs> And, and all of you know uh, one, two, maybe a handful of people who are like this. And, uh, and maybe, you know, if you don't know anyone who's like this, maybe you're the one. Um, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm serious here, is, is that, that when, we're, when you're around people who are faint-hearted in this way, it really drags your faith down. And so it's very easy for us to to uh, look down on them or to, to look down on them and, and be, you know, and just avoid them, uh, to do, you know, just to, we will do whatever it takes to, to not be uh, influenced by that uh, downtroddenness. But we need to encourage them. See, that's what Paul, see, see Paul understood that this was a temptation for every Christian. That there are Debbie Downers and, and David Downers who drag us all down, but, but we ought not to give up on them, but to encourage them, to lift them up, to nurture them, to remind them of God's love and grace and power and providence. Um, and then you, if you're faint-hearted, you need to hear that encouragement. Let it lift you up. Let it change your life. That they're still walking and breathing, and they're saved for eternal life, that no matter what happens, God will, will, God loves them and he's going to receive them into heaven. You can never be down if you know the, the glorious hope of, of the gospel. And it's, when, it's because we've forgotten the great hope and the joy that we ought to have. And that's how we ought to encourage the faint-hearted. Why? Because Jesus, Jesus, in the darkness of Calvary, on the cross, when the Father turned his face away and Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the deepest cry of despair. And Jesus experienced it all so that you might experience the great joy and gladness of God's face and love to shine upon you now and forever. And have, in, in, in many ways, haven't we been faint-hearted at one time or another? And hasn't God encouraged us, reminded us of his love in the gospel? Maybe somebody else has uh, more difficulty with that faint-heartedness. But it's not different. 
God has been patient and he's encouraged you in your faint-heartedness. Therefore, go and do likewise. And we also need to help the weak, to help those who are, are weak in faith or weak in body. And this is the heart of the gospel here, that Jesus was rich, but he became poor, that he was almighty God, but he became a weak man. He was powerful, but became powerless. He was Lord, but became a weak and humble servant. Why? To help you in your utter weakness, in your utter helplessness and inability. He came to seek and save and to lift you up, to heal you, to help you, and to empower you by his grace. He fed the hungry, he helped the poor, he healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind, he loved the poor and the needy, he helped the widows and the orphans, the weakest and the most marginalized in his day. He even came to help you. And so the only natural response to God's helping of us in our weakness is to help others in theirs. Do you see that? See, see, when we understand the full multidimensional aspects of the gospel being applied to us, we will then turn and we ought to do the same for others. That while we were weak, what did God do? He sent his son into the world to die for us. And therefore, God calls us to do likewise. So, so let me end here. That if you look at verse 15, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. See, this is, this is the principle of grace that the Apostle Paul is applying now to every other category of people. Just don't repay anyone evil for evil. And maybe the right way to put it is, don't treat people by works. Treat them by grace. Right? If somebody repays you, somebody gives you evil, turn the other cheek. Repay them with love. Uh, when all of these, when, when, because this is the way that God has treated you, has he not? He does not treat you the way that you ought to be treated according to works, according to justice, the way that you really deserve. But instead, he treats you by grace. When you sin, he gives you holiness. Uh, when you need forgiveness, he gives it to you. Um, and, and so we always seek to do good to one another. Not only uh, in applying this to our relationship to our leadership, but also our relationship to one another in the gospel. And so next week, next week we're going to look at the rest of Paul's exhortations. And, uh, and the point of all this is you will recognize them by their fruits. And this is a call and an exhortation to bear the fruits of the gospel in all that we do. So that every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. And so you will recognize them by their fruits. And these are the fruit of the gospel grace that has been planted in the church of Jesus Christ, in our church. And may all of these things contribute to your health, to our health together as we apply the gospel here at Faith Presbyterian Church. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful uh, application of the gospel to our lives. Help us to be patient. Help us to, uh, to apply the gospel in all of our relationships because you have given us the, the life of the gospel so that the world might know that we belong to you, that we would be a countercultural uh, example for the world to see, that you love sinners. We ask, O oh Lord, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, if you would uh, stand with me as we, as we have our closing hymn of praise, number 381, Brethren, we have met to worship. Number 381.
to the church of Jesus Christ, seeking to, to be a healthy church. Hear now his benediction to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Greet one another in the Lord.